Hello, class. Dr. Goodman here again. We're going to be continuing in our lectures dealing with Christian marriage. Again, as a reminder, when we say Christian marriage, we're talking about marriage that is between a man and woman in a biblical model of marriage. That being said, there is not always agreement in the area of Christian marriage, but there is a unified effort to look at marriage that is to be honoring of God. We're going to begin today's lecture by focusing on the material found in the Balswick's book, chapters two and three. And in these chapters, and we're going to be first talking about the models of marriage. We noticed the last time that there are various understandings of what that relationship between husband and wife should look like. Some are more egalitarian and uh, some are more the uh, complementarian view or the more traditional view. And we're going to get into more detail on that. But today I want us to begin again talking about the uh, Balswick approach on how we are to view marriage in a, in a Christian context. And they use what they call the Trinitarian model. This can be somewhat confusing if we don't really understand where they're headed with this. We're going to unpack that a little bit today, but I do want to encourage you uh, to, first of all, understand what is the Bible talking about when it's talking about the Trinitarian doctrine. That being said, that is a Christian theology statement that is based upon Scripture. Uh, scripture does not itself refer to in that language, Trinity. You never see that word in scripture. However, you see the truth of that. Uh, for example, we find in Genesis very clearly, it tells us that God created. And later in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Colossians, we get this message that all things are created through Christ. And we also see back in Genesis, this spirit hovering over the deep. So if you take Genesis chapter one, and you take the writings of Paul and Colossians, and you understand the unity of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, you are able to articulate the Trinity. I want to point out a few passages that talk about the unified nature of God that Christians have come to understand as a Trinitarian understanding. Uh, first of all, we find in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, this is the the last act of creation in the creation account. And there's a conversation going on among the Trinity. We see in chapter one, verse 26, it says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and the birds in the sky or the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This let us create in our image is the plural statements there. And so we understand that this is a view that says that while there is only one God, while Christians like Jewish individuals for whom this book was originally purposed, are monotheistic. We believe in one God. The Christian understanding that is three in one, that there is Father, Son, and Spirit who together make up one God. Uh, we find passages as well in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 16, for example. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and lighting, alighting on him. The voice of heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You see uh, the Father speaking into this event of Jesus. You see the Spirit of God hovering like a dove and descending and alighting upon him. You see this beautiful description of all, all three. And then in later in that same gospel, in Matthew uh, chapter 28, verse 19, you're going to hear these words. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this gives us the names and or identities of the persons of the Trinity. And John chapter 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1 is a reference to Christ. It is the gospel that tells the backstory of Jesus, that he's not just born in Bethlehem, that he's not just greeted by shepherds, and then later as a boy uh, greeted as uh, by the Magi. And he's not only a man that shows up on the scene, but he is almighty God who becomes flesh. He was with God and he was God, as it says in John chapter one. In the book, the Balswick book, we find in page 26, the second paragraph, says the basis for our seeing the Trinitarian relationships is a pattern that can shed light on human relationships may not be apparent. There really are two bases. First, the New Testament revelation bears witness to the fact that our relationships to each other are to be a mirror of God's own relationship to us in and through Jesus Christ, and that in turn, Jesus' relationship to us is a reflection of his own relationship to his Father. That while this image may not be first understood, as they freely admit, it's important to understand as they're articulating it, that marriage is understood to be a tight unity as there is in the Trinitarian family. We, we do notice, obviously, there is difference between divine and human. There's obviously a difference between three and one being monotheistic. But it is interesting that in the early parts of Genesis, when it talks about a man leaving his father and mother and clinging to or coming to be with his wife, it says they will be one, that they'll become one flesh. So this idea of unity, even in the marriage, which is why they tear it apart of a marriage is much more than just a breaking of a contract. It's a, it's a breaking of a divinely structured institution, a divinely designed relationship. We, we also see over on page 28, this idea that we have uniqueness even in marriages that are two people coming together as one. It says, so then, if human relationships are to mirror or image something of the divine relationships, then unity with distinction of persons in relationship also ought to characterize human relationships so that maintaining the distinct of persons does not compromise the unity, nor does the unity quench the uniqueness of the persons in communion with each other. So going back to the Trinitarian idea, there's a old diagram that talks about God. And if you can picture a triangle and in the center of that triangle is a big circle and it says God. And you have on the top of the triangle, Father, and on one side of the triangle you have the sun, the other side, you have spirit. And then you have lines from each of those two God. In other words, Jesus, the son is God, the spirit is God, the father is God. And then there's lines between the others on the triangle that the spirit, the spirit is not the father. The father is not the son. The son is not the spirit. In other words, while they're one, they, you, they remain distinct. This is important for us in marriage. Uh, marriage is not some type of arrangement or relationship where people truly lose their identity, where one person uh, is allowed to make the other person into whom they want them to be. It's a relationship of the two coming together with their distinct natures, with their distinct taste, with their distinct personalities, and make a betterment. They come together together and are stronger in many parts because of their differences. This is spelled out well in verse or in, on page 29. It says, with human limitations in mind, we use Trinitarian theology as a model for marriage. Spouses are both distinct 
male and female differentiation, and equal, directed to be fruitful and have dominion in their created purpose. So one of the questions is, what is their created purpose? What are humans to be doing? And there's all sorts of messages and sermons and books, but let us just go to the original understanding of what their purpose was. And this is in Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 through 25. Very significant passage to understanding the purpose of humanity. So the man gave names to all livestock and birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to him, to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother. And he's united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. One of the things that we find there is this powerful message again of them coming together for this purpose of being there for one another. Purpose of helping each other fulfill the purpose for which God has created them to do life together and to please him. And the message there is for those who are married, the husband is a better follower of Christ when his wife is supporting him in that. And the reverse, a wife who is a Christian is better in her faith as he supports her in that. So what is the difference or the danger of differentiation of not having that rather? So again, the the, the Balswicks are telling us that marriage is a, is a good thing and that there's unity, but there is not un, uniformity. There needs to be some differentiation. And they're pointing out, well, Balswicks do in this book, uh, what the danger of differentiation, of not having it is. It says, for example, a differentiated spouse not only recognizes personal anxiety, but it, but is also able to claim it and to soothe anger and fearful feelings rather than being reactive or to or blaming the partner for his or her emotions. What happens when we th say things like you complete me or I can't live without you or you are, you are my meaning for life is we're asking an imperfect person to do something they're not qualified to do. Uh, spouses meet each other's physical needs when they're doing what they should as a couple. Uh, spouses encourage one another emotionally. But if my happiness depends upon the actions of my spouse, if my sense of purpose and meaning depends upon the actions and or words of my spouse, then I'm setting my spouse up for failure and myself up for disappointment. Now that may sound contrary to what many of us think. And there's a reason because we've, we've often been taught this, that our spouse is to, to meet every single one of our needs. Well, the biblical truth is only God can do that. And while definitely the relationship in the marriage affects every other relationship we have and it affects our happiness and it affects our sense of purpose it should not be the final thing that determines if we are filling out fulfilling our purpose we're called to serve god as individuals and then come into unity to serve god together on the table 2.1 there on page 36 i encourage you to point that out and we talk about this particularity and relationality. This is their idea that we need not be completely differentiated, nor do we need to be completely enmeshed, but we need to be differentiated unity. We need not think about just independence and dependence, but interdependence. Now, dependence means that I need you to meet all of my needs. Independence says I'm on, I'm all right. 
where no matter what you do, interdependence is what you do affects me and what I do affects you. And therefore, we respect each other and love one another and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, as Ephesians says. But we also know that ultimately find our fulfillment in Christ. When we go on to chapter three of the Balswick book, we understand this, this covenant marriage idea. And you'll see the charts and you'll see the things that help us understand that. But I want you to read this chapter, obviously. And in verse or in page 38, in the second paragraph, it says, when what person doesn't want to be loved in faithful, unconditional ways or to be accepted just as they are and forgiven when mistakes are made? Who doesn't thrive when affirmed and empowered to each to reach one's full potential? Which one of us doesn't discover a deep sense of self through intimate giving and receiving of shared love? This very important idea that we support one another, love one another, encourage one another. And then we make a covenant in this, not just a promise. When we think about what they're trying to describe here, on page 41, there is a table, 3.2 types of marital commitments. What they are talking about there is this difference between conditional and unconditional, unilateral and bilateral. And there is in the bottom right corner of that, this mature covenant, this understanding that we are in this together in unconditional I love you. Now there's a limit to that. Uh, the Bible uh, clearly says in the, in the case of marital, unfelt, marital unfaithfulness or infidelity, in other words, uh, that there is a break that can, uh, that can happen uh, in marriages. But other than that ultimate betrayal, there's this idea of unconditional, I'm going to love you. When you're irritating me, I'm going to love you. When you disappoint me, I'm going to love you. When you don't say the words I wish you'd say, I'd love you. Uh, these ongoing type of things. And so I want, want to talk about this idea of security uh, that your book talks about. And they talk, they talk about these secure nature of the relationship uh, that, that happens uh, when couples are living by this, this covenant, living by this understanding of covenant. In this first section of this covenant understanding, which says a promise to sacrifice for the sake of relationship. I'm willing to sacrifice my own personal time. I'm willing to sacrifice my moment of, of alone so that I can better the marriage. Doesn't mean we give up everything, but it means I'm willing to sacrifice for the sake of the relationship. When this happens, the Balzacs say that there are three types of security that take place and those are secure love, secure sex, and secure relationship. I want us to unpack those a little bit as we look to understand what this is in covenant marriage. Now, to distinguish, before we get there, to distinguish this from other types of marriage, we understand that there is so much going on that's just this agreement based or this you scratch my back i'll scratch yours understanding or i'll love you till i get tired of you understanding there is a different approach biblically and therefore since we're trying to understand christian marriage we need to understand the biblical view of marriage and this idea of secure love is found in many places, uh, but I want us to go to the most famous passage in the scripture on love, uh, the most famous in regard to divine love would most likely be John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That is biblical truth. That is gospel truth. The passage that's more extensive that is very well known 
that comes in the letter of Paul to the Corinthian Christians. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want you to listen to the description Paul does of love, which is security. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. The marriage relationship is to show this type of love. Now, keep in mind, this was originally written to a church, so this type of love is not exclusively to be in marriages. It is to be in all relationships, but particularly in our closest human relationship, this needs to be happening. It says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Christian marriage needs to have patience and kindness. A Christian marriage needs to not have envy or boasting. One of the most important ones in there, I believe, is this idea of marriage having love that keeps no record of wrongs. One of the most damaging things that can happen within a marriage is the love that is brought down, that is overshadowed by a record of wrongs. How this plays out in marriages sometimes is at least symbolically what it do, what will do, what will happen is a spouse will uh, take a wrong and write it down figuratively I'm speaking, and place it in their back pocket or place it in their bedside stand and say, okay, I'm going to use this when I need it. I'm going to remind them. So when my spouse hurts my feelings, I'll come back and say, well, you did the same to me. Uh, I'll bring something up. And this is not to happen within relationships, particularly in the marriage relationship. We learn that from God who, who cast our sins to the sea. He just washes them away. And as couples in Christian marriages, they need to be able to deal with things and not hold them as ammo or hold them as some type of tool that can bring out whenever needed and say, well, I told you so, or I'll forgive you when you forgive me, this conditional statement. We need not have condition, con conditions upon our love. Another thing that comes up in this passage is looking at verse 8. Uh, the very first words we find there are love never fails. People, we could understand why, ask the question as they look at that verse or as they hear that verse, is that really true? Because they have seen what looks like love failing. They have seen their parents divorce. They have seen their own relationship break up. They, they've seen families that are nearly destroyed by this relationship that goes awry. So how do we understand this love never fails? The way I describe that is it's not love that fails. It's people who are to be doing the loving. So it's not that love fails. It's that we fail to love. And this book, Moses' book, but ultimately the scriptural book, is teaching us that we need to continue to love, not only in all the ways that 1 Corinthians 13 talks about, but we need to do so in a way where we say, it's not going to fail. I'm not going to fail to love. There's secure love. There's also within marriage, secure sex. You know, what's he talking about there? There's various things. We'll get to some of them. But one of the things that we need to point out is that Biblically speaking, sexuality or the act of sex is to be for marriage. Husbands and wives, that is the proper context for sex, for physical intimacy. As we well know, there is a lot of that outside of marriages. And we all know the damage that it often causes 
for example, to people that aren't married, live together. And one is more committed than the other. And one person wonders, is this person going to stay with me? Or there is the problem that somebody was promiscuous and along the way and came down with an STD and there's some, there's some pain, there's some worry. And while God is certainly a forgiving God and while all those things um, can be overcome through the power of the cross and people can repent, people can say, we're not going to live together anymore. We're going to get married. Uh, they can say we're, we're, we're going to abstain because we need to get our lives right individually, get our faith right, and then come back to being a husband and wife. Uh, sexuality is misused all over the place. And when it's misused, uh, there's pain. And so within the marriage context, there is a healthy sexuality and a secure sexuality. Uh, I want to read this passage uh, to you, and obviously you have it as well in your textbook. It says, the security that stems from covenant commitment brings freedom in the sexual relationship. A free-flowing, reciprocal giving and receiving knits together body, emotion, mind, and spirit. Being created for relationship, sexual expression is an aspect of marital intimacy that is mutual, mutually enjoyable. The security of covenant love encourages vulnerability that deepens the emotional bond. Through sexual intercourse, the course, the couple discovers holy meaning that enhances covenant love. There is an amazing amount of security and passion within a marriage that is operating correctly. Uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes there's physical issues or past trauma issues, but sex in its core is designed for marriage and therefore that's where it best thrives. Uh, Christians need not be ashamed of sexuality. They need not avoid the subject of sexuality. They just need to teach proper sexuality and be open and vulnerable with the con with the uh, conversation and very honest uh, with one another. To get an understanding of how the Bible addresses the subject I want us to go to a book uh, known as Song of Songs. In some Bibles, it is Song of Solomon, the same book. And throughout church history, uh, there has been a little embarrassment around this book. Not rightly so, but people haven't known what to do with it because it's a very erotic book in the best sense of the word. Because of that, people have said, well, we're going to make this an allegory understanding. And so there's some kind of conversation about this being the lover the one pursuing is god and the beloved the, the one who's receiving that love is israel or from the christian standpoint there's jesus as the groom and the church is the bride and certainly that analogy stays in the new testament but this book itself is written as love poetry as an expression of love one to another man to woman and to give us an idea of this we're going to go to chapter four, uh, verse 16, where she speaks and says, awake north wind and come south wind blow on my garden and his fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste his choice fruits. And then he responds, I've come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh, my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb. And my honey, I have drunk my wine and my milk. There's this very clear understanding. This is expressive poetry. And it is about a man and a woman. And there's much symbolism here. And again, this is very passionate language. This is very vulnerable language. This is an opportunity for people to, for couples to, to interact in a passionate way that says, I desire you. This is what she's saying. And symbolic, she's talking about her body by using this idea of fruit and garden. And, and then he comes along and says how much he enjoys that. And we need not be embarrassed about that. And so the Christian marriage, as opposed to some saying, well, Christian marriage must be boring. Uh, the Christian marriage, according to the 
actual text is saying it's a romantic thing. We'll be back in a moment. 